So welcome to tonight's Wu University presentation, Developing a Game Plan for Headaches and Concussion Protocol with Dr. Amanda Nassi. Oh, Mayan. There we go. And I am your host, Dr. Jennifer Stewart. So it is my great, great, great pleasure to introduce our wonderful colleague and a very good friend of mine, Dr. Amanda Nancy. She's the co-owner of a six doctor private optometric practice in Pembroke Pines, Florida, as well as the director of the Florida Institute of Sports Vision. She specializes in performance vision enhancement and vision rehab after TBIs. She's currently a team doctor for my, the Miami Dolphins, Inter Miami CF, Miami Check Gaming, as well as several other collegiate and high school teams. She's the immediate past chair of the AOA's Sports and Performance Vision Board and was previously adjunct faculty for NSU Optometry, where she co-developed and taught their elective on sports and performance vision. She's a Sports Vision Pro's partner, promoting the importance of vision and athletic performance across all levels of play. It is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Nancy to Wu Yu. Yay, thank you so much, Jen. I'm so happy to be here, you guys. Here's the financial disclosures I have to go over. Um, some of these not as pertinent to today's lecture as others. Um, they're on there. I will say out loud, um, I am on the advisory board for NeuroLens, but this is a CE lecture, so you will not hear me say that word again, um, but I will probably talk about PRISM a little bit, so don't leave. Stay. I promise it's worth listening and learning. Um, Sports Vision Pros, um, I'm a partner, and I will give you some, um, some resources at the end that you can use, but they're all free. All right. So we're good to go. Uh, again, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, it is my my career, my personal professional goal to try to change the landscape for us in sports medicine. There are so many things that we can do for athletes that no one else can do, especially this population that has head injuries and can just have lingering sy symptoms that go on and on, and no one else can fix the same things that we can fix. And if you're not a neurospecialist, if I say concussion, people sometimes say that's not me. And that's really why I'm excited to be here is to kind of break that down and give you really great things to do for not only those patients, but the headache patients that we see all the time and every practice. So you already heard a little bit about me from uh, Jen's intro there. So I'm gonna skip this. I promise all my slides will not look like this. This is one of the ones that I have on here that's pretty long that I do want to read a few specific parts from. I do not know that some of you guys will have a 10 question test that you'll have to do in order to get your CE. So you might notice throughout the lecture that a few things are highlighted that I find extra important. So pay attention for those. This is a joint statement that we made from AOA several years ago. And the whole purpose of this statement is to not only say how common concussions are, um, that they're even happening to, to patients likely that are coming into your practice. One in every 225 Americans sustain a TBI each year. They're not all going to be athletes. And based on those numbers, um, there's a decent amount of your patients that are going to come in each month that might have a concussion. And it does not have to be a structural damage to the brain. It could just be a mild traumatic brain injury. That is the definition of a concussion where you just have any bump, blow, or jolt to, jolt to the head or the body. So a lot of times they're not going to have been to an emergency room because they don't really know that anything happened to them that was significant. And you might be the one to bring it up or else they had a head injury went to the emergency room and said, everything's fine. Your CT came back fine, your MRI came back fine, whatever it was, but they're still having symptoms. And you can identify those and maybe be able to give them some help. Doctors of optometry have the ability to detect, identify, treat, and sometimes refer these patients, not just neurooptometrists, but every optometrist. So our goals for today, Part one, I want you to understand a concussion a little bit from a patient perspective, which happens to be me. 
Uh, I had a concussion back in 2018 that really changed my focus of what I wanted to do as an optometrist and how I wanted to grow this part of our profession. Um, and part two, I'll actually be giving you the details of how you can help that population. And of course, I have a disclaimer in here. There's a lot more to learn about visual neuro evaluations and treatments than what we're going to talk about tonight. But hopefully, this will be the basics of what you guys need to know to get started. And if you want to learn more, there are a ton of great resources for me doing what I do, getting players, getting student athletes, getting people to return to play, return to learn and return to work and just being normal again. That's what we're a part of. So first, we have to understand what the concussion is. And if we were in in person, I would have you show your hand and say, how many people here feel comfortable managing a TBI patient? And for this lecture, I'm assuming I have a wide variety of docs that are either very interested in this, this part of our profession and they already are kind of comfortable, but hopefully I have a lot of you that are not so comfortable and we can kind of change that. This one though, how many people feel comfortable managing a headache patient? More of you would likely raise your hand because this is a complaint we get on a almost daily basis, probably from patients, especially if you're asking the question if they have headaches. And I say feel comfortable managing a headache, but when I really think about it, what I learned in school, I don't know how much I was actually managing the headache patient. I was more just making sure it wasn't something bad that I needed to refer for. I don't know if I always had a way to exactly help them. So we might change that. So I show you these pictures of the accident where I uh, got my concussion just to show you it was not the worst accident ever. And it was just a car accident. It wasn't even anything cool. I don't have a good story to tell. Um, the guy on the left um, wasn't paying attention and rear ended us at a, at a red light. And if you look over here, um, kind of close and let me see that picture's in the way. Um, if you look over on the right side of the, the page there, you can actually see my reflection um, kind of holding my head walking by the car, not because I was like, oh, I hit my head, but because I realized that the auto refractor that I borrowed from my friend Keith Smithson that belonged to a uh, an MLB team was actually right behind where that door got smashed. And I was really flipping out about that. But like any good optometrist, after I, I hit my head on the, the A-frame um, by the, the passenger door, I was, I was not driving, I was a passenger. Um, I noticed I did have like a, a big lump on the side of my head that was kind of like cool to the touch. I didn't really even have that much of a headache at that point. I was like looking in the mirror, like checking my pupils and, it wasn't until several days later that I realized that I did have symptoms of a concussion, which is very common. I call this slide the symptoms I knew to ask because I had seen concussion patients before. I knew the questions that I was supposed to ask, and I thought I pretty much knew what all of these things meant. But when it happens to you, of course, your perspective changes a little bit. Most common things you're going to see are headaches from these patients. Some of the things that would um, that would definitely be something that you would say, hey, I think I can do something about that would be the blurry vision, light sensitivity. That's one of the things that always comes up as something you would expect from a concussion patient. Um, so that one, they, they might end up in your chair. Difficulty sleeping, very common mood shifts and dizziness. Dizziness is one of the biggest indicators that they're going to have a tougher time recovering in general. Um, and it was actually the, the mood shift uh, that kind of let me know that I had a concussion several days after when I was in my exam lane and I held up a, a 20 diopter lens to try to focus on a retina and I I couldn't clear it. Like I was blurry and I like flipped my lens over, you know, thinking that it was just backwards, still couldn't clear it. Um, I was like, what is going on? So then of course, like any good optometrist, I was like, somebody do a BCC on me now, you know, and I like had somebody check me out and I was like, this is crazy. And I walked into my office manager's uh, office and I was like, I think I need to go see my neuropsych. I, I think I have a concussion. And she said, um, I thought that you, something was wrong because you kind of gave me like a weird side eye earlier today. And that wasn't the thing. It was that as soon as she said it, I kind of put my hands up and I was like, am I crying? 
it, cause I couldn't control it, but I immediately started crying when she said I gave her a side eye and I was like, Whoa. So, um, emotions, that's a big red flag that you might see. So I said headaches, that's one of the more common things you'll see with a concussion and with other patients in your chair. So let's talk about different types of headaches. These are the things you learn in school, right? You doctor flop the headaches. You find out how long they've been having. You kind of look for things that are big red flags. If they're like in, in one area for a, a long amount of time, um, let's go through them and kind of see what we know about headaches. So this is something I found on the always reliable internet about what is a concussion headache. And I'm just gonna say no, <laughs> because all the headaches um, that, that come from concussions are different. Everyone's going to be different. Um, no two concussion patients are gonna look the same. So let's talk about some actual headaches. Tension type headache, this is the most common. Um, it's that bilateral squeezing, type sensation. It has a lot of triggers for a lot of people, including, you know, stress, um, maybe talking to your office manager, stressing you out, um, a lot of different things. And a lot of patients will have these. It says 60%, 60 to 80% of the population actually can have these. And like I said, it's the most common. This one's sad because the medication overuse headaches are often happening because people are trying to medicate themselves to get rid of their headaches. It has to do with the upregulation and the downregulation that goes on when you're taking these different medications. Uh, often patients that suffer from migraines, um, they can end up with these medication overuse headaches. And I mean, the, the patient that comes in with this is sometimes a little bit easier to diagnose when you look at their list of meds that they're on. Migraine without aura. I have to tell you that um, as a doc, I feel like I am more annoyed more often than not when a patient tells me they get migraines because my first question after they say I get migraines is, is not, you know, is it unilateral or do you have nausea or vomiting? It's usually, was it diagnosed by a doctor? And they're usually like, no, but I've always had migraines to which I'm like, if you were suffering from headaches all the time that are like this, you need to get it checked out. But like I said, unilateral is the really big one. Not everyone's going to have the aura, um, but a lot of the a lot of times patients have these and it, it knocks them out. And sometimes it'll run in their family. But I think that we're pretty, pretty familiar with migraines. Um, as far as what causes the migraine, the pain from the migraine, that's something that that has been well documented and you may have heard, you know, has to do with constriction of blood vessels. Um, but the pain itself comes from the trigeminal nerve that is the only sensory nerve that innervates the whole dura, the whole scalp. So actually all these headaches that we're getting involve that trigeminal nerve in some way or another. Migraine with aura. So these are the ones that we obviously say, well, now I got to dilate you, even though it really sounds like it's an aura, we need to make sure that it's not the flashes that go with floaters or anything else. So like I said, I feel like that one we're, we're probably pretty good with the zigzag lines and all that pieces of the clock missing sinus headaches. I feel like are also one ones that are a little bit more straightforward. The big one is if you've got a big sinus pressure buildup and you bend over, you feel like your head's going to explode. It's that pressure, you know, in, in school, I think we learned that you know, we can tap here and see if there's pressure, if there's pain. Very common. I feel like allergies are running rampant in Florida right now. Um, and a lot of people are getting sinus headaches. And then there's the ominous headache, which just means the headaches that they start describing them to you. And you're like, this sounds really bad. And it's typically like, it's always in this one place. Yeah, I've had it for a long time, but I haven't done anything about it and it's getting worse. And then you're looking at nerves to see if they're swelling and you're like, what is going on with this patient? So this is the big reminder that when we talk about treating headaches, if I tell you something that works for a lot of my headache patients, I'm probably also making sure they don't have bilateral swollen nerves, right? We always have to make sure that it's not the type of headache that could have a really huge pathology behind it. And then there's this other thing called proprioceptive conflict that can sometimes lead to those headaches. So I'm going to tell you that this type of a headache is um, often bilateral. You come with a neck pain, sometimes a shoulder pain, 
dry eye sensation. That kind of sounds like it's something that we should be able to fix or at least maybe do something about. Um, light sensitivity, and it's usually going to be worse when they are reading or doing uh, work at near, which for a lot of our patients now is screen time on the computer as well. So let's talk more about this one. I'm not going to get too into anatomy, and you'll notice no highlighting here, so don't panic. Um, but the trigeminal nerve, it's not just a clever name. It does bifurcate and go into three different branches. The one that might interest you the most is the one that goes right into the eye and provides those um, sensory fibers to the cornea. Which So it's the same nerve. If you remember, it's the same one that I said also innervates the dura. It goes into the eye and then also down the back of our neck. So if something were to happen to irritate that nerve, to flare that nerve, we might have some different effects that go with it, like that pain, like that dry eye sensation. So what could flare that nerve potentially? This is where we get more like, ah, this, this is us, right? So eye misalignment. I'm going to talk about phorias. And we know Everybody has some sort of euphoria, and I'm going to explain it the same way that I do to my patients, because I think that maybe this is a way you can explain it to your patients. I usually say most people's eyes don't naturally rest in the perfect lined up position, and both of your eyes see two different pictures. So if you want to see single vision and not have double vision, they have to be aimed in the perfect place. So if your eyes are naturally a little bit misaligned, you haven't been seeing double because your brain, your body is so smart. It compensates and it pulls it all together. And that's why you're seeing one picture. Some of us have more misalignment naturally than others. And some of us have better compensating systems for the misalignments than others. But if for some reason something breaks down and we're not doing a great job compensating for that, sometimes we have symptoms that flare. So that, these symptoms over here on the right, um, headache, neck pain, eye strain, all of these can come from this misalignment correction. And this is where, you know, when I was first learning about this, I was like, all right, I remember in school learning about eye muscle movements and it was like LR6, SO4, the rest three. And I was like, trigeminal, <laughs> inappropriate acronym. Yeah, that's five. That wasn't one of those. And it's not because it's not actually a motor nerve. It's not moving the eyes, but what it is responsible for is the proprioceptive response to then move your eyes. So if your sensory system says, I need my eyes to point here, that's the trigger. And that's how that eye alignment can then trigger these symptoms. And when I learned it, I was like, how did I not realize this before? Um, these are a few more details about it. We said, like I said, it's, it's symptoms associated with overstimulation of this nerve. So for me, I'm gonna connect the dots right now for you. I just told you that if you have a big eye misalignment and that trigeminal nerve is working overtime, that can cause headaches. My concussion patients might come in seeing this picture. And what is this? You know, a lot of times you have a, a tech bring back a patient and they say, oh, the patient's seeing double. And you're like, are they seeing double with one eye open? Are they seeing double with two eyes open? Because sometimes a patient might say double, but it's really just blur, but it's interpreted as double, or maybe they have cataract, whatever it is. But we need to know that the way that people describe what they're seeing, it varies for different people. And one thing that happens if your alignment starts to break down is you start to get blur and then you go double. You learned this when you learned your point of convergence and you said, tell me when this gets blurry and then it breaks into two, right? It's your accommodative system, but it also happens with your vergent system. I would always think about when I was in class, like trying to pay attention and not fall asleep, like, like right as you know, you're starting to daze off and you start to go double because your posture is kind of going where it wants to go. So the patients that are having headaches, if it's because of an alignment, it may be they just got a new job where they're sitting on a computer so much more than they were before. Um, and now I have to work harder. But for my concussion patient, their normal was probably sufficient. 
they had a virgin system that could accommodate for whatever that misalignment was. But as you're going to see on my next slides, the number one things that happen after concussion with the visual system are issues with the accommodative system and the virgin system. And if it's not firing on all cylinders with the double or with the receded near point of convergence or with the ghosting or with the fact that, um, now all of a sudden they feel dizzy and they can't process when things are coming by them in their periphery and they feel like they're sitting in their car and it's the Millennium Falcon. Um, you can't really tell because there's a lot of colors here, but I will tell you that that is supposed to be highlighted in yellow. I say the eyes are liars because it has been known for years and years and years by all doctors, by all MDs, DOs, to see concussion patients that if they have if they have dizziness, if they have balance issues, they send them to vestibular therapy. They send them to vestibular treatment. And it's because the eyes are liars. Um, I know in Florida, this is something we see in a lot of places, but if you've ever been in a tunnel like this, um, they're usually like in amusement parks. The idea is that bridge is stationary. It's not moving, but they simulate motion around you in this tunnel. And of course you walk down the tunnel like you're drunk and you feel all imbalanced. But yet, if you walk into the middle of that bridge and you close your eyes, your vestibular system and your proprioceptive system, your feet would say, I'm not moving. But then even, even if you did one of these numbers and you kind of like tunnel visioned to look down the center, you would say we're not moving. But as soon as your brain gets different information from the peripheral visual system, it overrides all the other systems. I'm not going to say it's more important, but in this situation, it's kind of more important. And that's why a lot of those patients just need help getting that eye alignment where it needs to be. Because if you start to lose the alignment, you start to get ghosting and blur and weird things not matching up and you can't process it and you're symptomatic. Uh, I think maybe, Jen, this is a good time to get questions. Because I want to make sure everybody follows this because it was it was weird the first time I, you know, like I said, I learned it and I started thinking about the link with these patients. So let's see what anybody wants to ask. Yes, we've got a few that are here, but please, if you have a question so far, if you're not sure if she's going to cover it, put it in here anyway, because I'd love to be able to ask some questions. Somebody did have a great question that came in and um, we're not sure if you're going to go over this later, but can you explain the effect of blue light? on TBIs. I've heard that blue light blockers may be harmful outdoors during the day, especially with, for people with a history of TBIs because the blue light is needed to help set or rest circadian rhythm. What are that's such thoughts? a smart question, right? Because the circadian rhythms, that's a great, great question. Um, I will touch on that later. And gosh, we know blue light could be like a whole lecture because there's like so many people that are like, this is true. No, this is true. But the things that I, and this, again, this is what I say to my patients. There are some things that we know to be factual and some other things that we still don't exactly know. Um, as far as the circadian rhythms, it's definitely a problem. So you do want blue light during the day, but remember you get it from other places other than digital devices. You get it from the sun. Like they obviously know that's your number one place. Um, but if you're on devices, when the sun goes down, that's when you do want a blue light filter. So um, in that scenario, you, you might want to recommend to use a blue light filter on your phone rather than wearing the blue light filtering lenses, right? Um, but um, we do know that it is a, a little bit harder to focus on the blue light spectrum than some of the other parts of the spectrum. I always say, if you look at Christmas lights during the holidays that are multicolor Christmas lights, all the lights will look more concise in the blue light. They scatter a little bit more. Um, and these patients are really uncomfortable in front of a really white screen. So I think some sort of a blue light filter is good, but if you have the sleep disturbances, you have to rethink this and make sure that they're not just blue light filtering everything all the time. This is a great question that just came through. And I think one that a lot of us are probably thinking, and um, how are concussions di actually diagnosed? If a patient had trauma, is there a definite way to diagnose concussion or is it based on symptoms? 
Yeah, a lot of it is symptoms. Um, there is an fMRI that can be done, uh, a functional MRI where you can diagnose a concussion, but they are crazy expensive and no one's going to have it done. For the most part, they're going to go and they're going to, um, in, in a general hospital setting, they're going to rule out structural damage, but say if you have symptoms, it's a concussion. In an athletic population, they have good baselines like impact testing, where they're going to look at certain markers, including visual markers, which is why it's crazy that we haven't been a part of this team sooner. Um, visual memory, um, a lot of different breakdowns that they can do a, a, a baseline versus the post and say, well, all of this is deficient. Um, balance is typically going to be deficient. Um, near point of convergence is very often deficient. Um, saccades are very often deficient, which is why you'll see either a DEM or a, a King Devic on a lot of the, the pre and post tests. Thanks. You have time for one more question before you get back into it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How long did your symptoms last? That's a Ooh, question that just came yeah. up. So um, mine were really intense for a while and then slowly started to get better. I will tell you, I am textbook the worst patient. Like I never did anything I was supposed to. I went, I went to work the day right after I had, <laughs> had the car accident. Um, but I'll tell you that symptoms did get better once I started being a better patient. Uh, and I did have some visual interventions and a couple of really other cool things. Um, that my uh, my neuro colleagues will probably be familiar with that one of, one of the doctors got me into like red, um, like infrared therapy and things like this, but slowly but surely, I'll tell you that um, concussion patients, if they don't have a really great night's sleep though, symptoms can flare back up like crazy. So I was, I was doing vision tracking on myself every single day and like documenting like when my symptoms were better and worse and I'll stop, I could just keep going. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I will, we'll get back to your lecture again, just a reminder to ask your questions throughout the presentation. There's a few that we haven't gotten to. Um, we will leave some time at the end for the rest of the questions, but please, please keep them coming and we'll try to. Thank you. So here is the interprofessional team. And, and um, if you really think that this is something that you want to get into more. Um, I'll say that the, um, the PsyD, the neuropsychologist, um, is a really big piece of the puzzle that can get you in with these patients because they're doing the impact testing and saying, hey, there's something wrong with vision. And that's how I got um, connected with actually a lot of my teams. So here are the most common uh, visually related issues that we have after a TBI. Uh, like I said, Highlighted stuff is important. Convergence insufficiency um, is on there, although I wouldn't say it's convergence insufficiency. I would say it's receded convergence or receded near point of convergence. Convergence insufficiency is like a BV diagnosis with a triad that you look for, but it's really just that they can't bring in things without them getting blurry or going double. It's more of a spatial issue that they just can't figure out where they are in space. Um, but I'll tell you that we're not the only ones testing for this. VOMS which is the main thing that they're going to probably do anywhere that they're testing for how they're actually responding to, to vision and movement. Um, they're checking a conver convergence with that. So if they don't see you, they're probably going to go to an OT that's going to pencil push up them to death. And guess what? If they were their whole life, a plus one hyperope, but never needed anything because their accommodative system and their virgin system was doing what they needed to, now, if their accommodative system uh, knocks out on them, now they can't get everything together and you can pencil push up them to death and nothing's going to change. Um, even earlier this year from Mayo, if you looked up the symptoms of a concussion, there's nothing with vision here. This one, the only thing that would usually come up is um, uh, like light sensitivity, right? And everything says point them to vestibular. Now this has changed because the, con the concussion census that came out this past year from Amsterdam does point to vision. So again, there's a good chance that these patients are going to end up in your chair and you got to know what to do with them. So let's tell you what to do with them. What does a TBI exam look like? Do I have to do a cycloplegic refraction, do some other fancy tests? Let's break it down. So first thing, histories. Histories are huge, especially if you're going to see this patient for a follow-up, you've got to have a really good baseline to know what's going on. Um, if you have handouts um, 
that I sent in. I know this is really small, but if you just Google uh, the Brain Injury Visual Symptom Survey, B-I-V-S-S, you'll get this one on the left. And this is the one I use for all of my um, all of my concussion patients. It's really great, developed by Hanu Lobkin like a long time ago. Um, the one on the right um, is a lifestyle index from a company that does a test for contoured prism. It's also a good test. The point is have something that you can do for a really good baseline intake. This is a good this is good representation of what I would do in a, in a first visit for these patients. Um, optic nerve function, structure, visual acuity, confrontation fields, color vision testing. We're gonna check EOMs, near point, stereo pupils. This is all stuff that every one of you know how to do. Um, over on the right, um, these are some of the BV tests that we do. Some people might be more comfortable with all these binocular vision tests than others. You know, sometimes if I say BCCs, people are like, what are you talking about? But I'll tell you, everybody knows how to do a cover test because I know you're doing those. Um, but you have to get a good refractive status highlighted, most important, because you can have a small amount of astigmatism, small amount of hyperopia, small amount of anything. And now it's going to cause a huge problem. So sometimes, even if you don't do anything special, but give them their prescription alone, you're going to help a lot. So what do we do with the findings? These are, these are what I call low-hanging fruit. So your, your refractive or your accommodative correction, okay? You have to be comfortable checking their near point standings where they are. And you're going to see a lot of lags on the BCC. Or if you end up doing NRA, PRA, you're going to see that they're balanced with more plus. Whatever it takes for you to find out that they need plus, that could be the answer. For me, I'm always looking at what seems to be the bigger problem. Is it accommodation or is it vergence? It's either that they have a really weird misalignment or it's that they have a really bad focusing system or a combination of the two. Um, if it is a vergence problem, prismatic correction will help them. And this is, this is the really hard thing to, to push for doctors, because I know there's so much history that you might have with prisms thinking like prisms are poison and it's going to make them get reliant on it. And it's going to make it worse. Or why would I open up that can of worms or nanacy? What if they don't have double vision? Why would I give them prism? I'm telling you that a small amount of prism can do so much. And I'll show you some examples of that, but basically just think about the fact that if they're trying to lift, you know, this, this five pound weight and they just can't do it, I'm coming in and I'm maybe even giving them a pound of it or two pounds of it, whatever it is. And it's just enough to get them where they need to go to where everything else can start to get better. But sometimes vision is going to be the thing that is just the roadblock because vision takes up so much of your neurological system. And people just think it's reading a VA chart. We know that's not the case, but if vision is holding them back, other things, sometimes they don't get better. Um, so blue light photochromatics, like I said, might be, might be the way to go. Harmon's distance, that's, that's just elbows distance, right? Like how about you don't hold your phone right here, right? Just, Pull it back because that's easier. Um, good visual habits. Um, binasal occlusion is kind of maybe getting in the weeds, but I'm that's one of the things that you know I learned about it in books, and I was like, oh, this I guess that makes sense. But when I actually had my concussion with horrible symptoms that like during like the middle of a patient day would flare, and I could literally just sit there and, and do this and feel almost instant relief. It was crazy mind blowing. And the whole concept of this is that this eye sees all this stuff and this eye sees all this stuff. So everything in the middle, you have to process. It takes more energy from your brain is what I say. So sometimes just doing this little bit of an occlusion, like even in a break for your students, uh, pro athletes really hate it when you put scotch tape on their glasses, <laughs> but you know, if they need it when they're in film room, by golly, they'll do it. Okay, so here are the components of a prescription lens. Don't be not, don't be afraid that prism might be one of those components. Um, and a little bit can go a long way. And that's one of 
the other biggest take homes, I would say. Um, this is a, a paper that explains that, and it comes with data from a study that everybody knows, part of it's coming from CITT, when we learned that the most symptomatic patients weren't necessarily the ones with the worst phorias. It just has to do with who can compensate for what. So you might have somebody that's like, you know, 10 XO and you're like, oh yeah, this is, hello, this is probably a problem. Or you might have someone that's three XO, but if for some reason they can't compensate for it, they need help. Or maybe they've been three XO their whole life. And now, oh my God, they need an ad power and they have a giant ACA ratio and they go from a three to a seven XO just with a little bit of plus, maybe that's causing a problem for them but it's, it's hard to measure very small amounts of prism unless you practice and you get better at it, but you can do it. The evolution of prism. So this was big for me, um, but I could potentially prescribe a contoured prism because as we know, you're not gonna need the same amount of prism most of the time up close and far away. And I do also wear that hat where I think about like, ooh, I'm asking them to buy things. And I like being able to say one pair of glasses instead of two pairs of glasses or three pairs of glasses. So I do like a good contour prism. So these were really impressive results from a, um, a research, but from um, a, a number of patients that were treated with um, contoured prism. It was a, a population of people that were having chronic headaches um, that were actually picked up from a, a neurologist practice. And it was like, all right, let's do some contoured prism because things weren't getting better. And these are the results as far as their, their symptoms improving. And the ones that kind of stick out that are surprising are like dry eye. And it makes sense because like we said, that trigeminal nerve is also causing that dry eye symptom. So your patient might legit have dry eye. Or you might look behind the slit lamp and go, their tear and meniscus looks normal. Like everything looks fine, looks like good quality, but they have these symptoms. Maybe do a cover test and see if you find something surprising. Or maybe it's not so surprising, but they're just not compensating for it. Here's that other chronic headache study. 93% of patients had a positive response. 82% of them said that their symptoms were basically gone. And I will tell you, I have seen a crazy number of concussion patients at this point because of my referral base that I've developed um, through the different hospital systems and schools. And my typical protocol is wear these glasses full-time, whatever, whatever it is, I want you to wear them full time for two weeks and then come back and see me. And I can't even tell you the number of people that are like, I feel so much better. Or the parents are like, they are so much better. I had my first patient this morning actually came in after two weeks and um, I had wrote in the notes um, and I always do this that like, yeah, they're, they're having a hard time reading, but patient has never been an avid reader. Patient has always been, you know, better at this than that, hates reading. And they came back and said, I've read two books <laughs> since I got the glasses. And I was like, that's awesome. Mom was very happy. So here are some case studies. Um, Chris, so this one was, I'll say one of, at the times, one of my most symptomatic patients that I had seen. Um, he had had a car accident a year prior to me seeing him. He had dropped out of, um, out of school. He actually went to school in Orlando and dropped out, um, came down back home and he came into the office with sunglasses on, holding on to the wall, like leaning on the wall because he couldn't even stand up straight. And when the techs put him in the auto refractor, they were like, we can't even get a measurement on him because his eye movements were so erratic. Um, I'm gonna exit the presentation to show you. I have a, a vision tracking program that I use that shows me what their eyes are doing, right and left eye. And in the presentation, I go straight to his, which I think is not helpful, but if you don't know what a normal one looks like. So let me show you what a normal one looks like. Go back in here. All right, so this is showing what the right and the left eye are doing, just following a dot around in the circle gives you scores and everything, but it shows you, you're looking for you know them to be fairly symmetrical, fairly accurate, fairly smooth. And then if I scroll down here, you can see this is a horizontal pursuit, which is really important for reading books and staying in school and not losing your scholarships and 
whatnot. So now let me show you a little picture. Put my own little toolbar where I needed to get to my PowerPoint. So let me go back into the presentation. Drum roll, all the suspense as we want to see Chris's tracking and Nancy can't get it to go. I'm just gonna open it up from the beginning because my toolbar is blocking it. So I'm just gonna flip through. Mm -mm -mm -mm. This would be a good place to take a question, but I'm gonna be there fast, so. All right, so that, my friends, the one on the left is his horizontal pursuit. That is what happened when he just tried to go left to right. And the one on the right over here is his circular pursuit. So this was initial measurement. I did a cover test on this guy and I trial framed the smallest amount of prism. And my neuro friends are gonna say, did you give him yoked prism? Cause you said he was walking sideways. I just gave him basin prism. I kid you not like a diopter of basin prism. And this is immediately after. And he put on the trial frame and he sat up and he looked very confused <laughs> because all of a sudden everything stopped moving for him. Um, so he wore the glasses. I didn't see him for way longer than I want, would have wanted to see him. Um, kind of lost him to follow up. And he came back because he lost his glasses. Um, it was months, months later. Um, and he came in and he was really confused because he was like, I lost my glasses and I was really concerned, but I seem fine. And I was like, well, Chris, and I ran right. I, I ran the tracking test on him again. And I was like, it's because you're better and you don't need them anymore. So again, with these concussion patients, you're giving them the prism to just take the weight off. And you expect them to get back to where they were. He had zero script in his glasses. It was Plano with one diopter of basin. And any of you could do this. This is one of my patients that's, um, I'm looking at time. Okay, I got a few more minutes before questions. So um, this was a 13 year old referred from the children's hospital for concussions. Um, this is some of her exam data. You can see she, she did have dizziness, motion sensitivity, headaches worse with activity. Um, she said that she does have, um, intermittent double vision at near she's 2020, very small prescription. Yes. Receded near point of convergence. Um, and it gets worse when you repeat it. Um, that's one of the things that we look at for, if we don't have a good baseline, does it look like they're actually back to their norms or is it really that their system's just failing? It'll typically get worse when you repeat it, but everything else was pretty normal, but, um, here's her four areas. So again, it's possible that she was totally fine before the concussion. And she was, um, these numbers aren't off the chart, but I think that you can see that, you know, with that near point of 10.89 XO, maybe she needs a little bit of help. So this, um, this particular recommendation from this device, Ooh, I should have blocked that out said 2.0 base in. So I gave it to her. Um, and as you would probably expect, since she's one of my case studies, um, she did some basic therapy exercises, wore glasses for one week, mom reported. Molly's headaches were completely gone, no longer dizzy, no double vision. She was fantastic. Um, and again, nothing crazy that I did here. And when I say home exercises, um, I give some really basic spatial localization and just peripheral awareness drills, not big vision therapy. It's literally no tools no broth strings. I don't do central fixation tasks with concussions because that's the last thing you want to do. You need to fix their periphery so they don't feel like they're in the tunnel, right? So here's one more. So this one I saw at the end of the day on a Saturday back when I was still doing Saturdays. And I saw my schedule as a 16 year old girl. And I was like, this is going to be easy. I'm going to be out of here. And my tech comes in and goes, Dr. Nancy, mom brought a whole folder full of MRIs and doctor reports. And I was like, Oh, good. I'm so glad we're going to get to help her. Um, and that was her complaint. Shadowy vision. Um, she had headaches, eye strain. She'd seen a neurologist, had an MRI that was normal. 
she saw her previous doctor who was an ophthalmologist. And I'll tell you, I work with a ton of ophthalmologists that I love, but this particular ophthalmologist saw her and said, everything's normal. Even though she had double vision at near. There are Maddie's Boreas. And I said, I bet she would benefit from some prism. So I kind of got into my like my mode of, okay, I have to sell somebody something. And I kind of sat back and I, I looked at mom and I said, okay, so I really think that I can help her, but you're going to have to get her a pair of glasses that aren't going to be covered by the insurance. And she says, Dr. Nancy, you can go ahead and stop. She said, I know what you want to prescribe because you saw her sister, Molly, <laughs> over a month ago, but like, of course, again, they never reported back to me. And she was like, Molly is doing fantastic. So I know that I want to get these glasses for Maddie. And again, if, if I hadn't seen her sister and kind of clued them in that I could help, like, would this patient have ever come to me? And again, that's, that's our mission is to let people know what we can do. So I prescribed her, um, again, 2.0 basin. Um, which she wouldn't need forever. She um, was, uh, I think she was a cheerleader as well. Um, I had glasses for her, but she also wore contacts and eventually she wouldn't need that prism. And I feel like this is a question that somebody's wanting to ask. So I'm going to, I'm going to answer it and get that page off there. So um, what I typically tell the patients is your eye posture is your eye posture. And it has always been like that because the question is, especially with student athletes, am I going to have to wear these glasses forever? That's not the goal. You're going to need these glasses more than you will in the future, but the glasses will always work for you because you were just really good at lifting all this weight. We're just going to do some of the work for you so you can continue to get better. But eventually you're going to want to use these when you're in class. You're going to want to use them when you're taking big tests. When you get the SATs, you know, in a couple months, good Lordy, wear the glasses, take the strain off your visual system so you can actually focus on comprehension and not just putting your eyes in the right place. Um, and then, you know, the next year, if I test them and they're not symptomatic, maybe they don't need them again, but they could use them. It's not that they're getting something that they won't ever use again in two weeks when I fix them. So there's my summary. Um, again, symptoms might be subtle. Those same things that you're doing for the concussion patients, if you have patients that have had chronic headaches and nothing's making them better, and it looks like it could be an eye misalignment issue, give them a small amount of prism and see if you can take that weight off their system. I was ashamed to see, like when we started testing, all of our staff members, my mother-in-law that had this huge exo that like I never really even thought anything about and you give them the help and they say, my headaches are gone. And then they're off medications. They're not doing Botox on their head anymore. It's crazy the amount of help that you can make that's so much more than just glasses. It's, it's life-changing. It really is.